Hi, Linda. Hi, Matt. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. I am here outside in my lanai. As you can see, it's beautiful and sunny. It's in the high 70s here in uh, Palm Bay, Florida. It looks kind of sunny behind you. It is sunny from a little bit. You can see the parking lot. It's going to be 80 degrees today, so it's gorgeous outside. Oh, so the, the coasts are gorgeous. Absolutely. I don't know what in the world is going on, uh, you know, if you go north or, or central, but it is gorgeous on, in Florida and California today. Yeah, and we'd like to welcome everybody to our uh, sixth episode of It's So Road. And we want to start off with some really cool news. You want to share that? Uh, I, I do. I do. So yesterday, about this time yesterday, the governor of California came out with a uh, with a statement about California's reopening plan. Now, California um, has been very slow to reopen, um, and they've got this really weird color thing going on for, you know, which counties are in which color. Um, but the important thing is on June 15th is the date they're scheduling to throw the color system out the window and completely reopen the economy. Now, basically what we're, what we're understanding that this means is conventions, amusement parks, all sorts of stuff is going to reopen with no capacity limits. So that's huge. But there's going to be a couple of things that still have to happen. The first one is they're going to make you wear the face mask wherever you go. That's still uh, California state law. But the second thing is for shows like Road to California in January, you'll need to show a vaccination card or you'll need to show a negative COVID test within a certain period of time prior to your arrival. And I should have brought my vaccine card in um, to hold it up, right? But you need to have that pretty little CDC vaccination card um, before you head on out to Road to California in January. Um, California is open for vaccines right now for anybody, um, at least in our county. The state will be open here next week. So there's really no reason to not get a vaccine. You know, both both my husband and I, we, we got both of our shots and um, we're ready to go. So the you know the real the real fear about in person was you know them only letting us have like you know hundred people in the room while the vendors take up more than hundred people. So this is really exciting that that they're that they have a reopening plan. So I think that's really good news. It's about time. It's about time. Right? So, uh, Linda, you've got some information about Road at Home. They can register for classes right now for Road at Home, can't they? Yes, they can. Road at Home registration is open. We worked really hard um, to give you a really wide selection of classes and a lot of really cool classes. And um, we also have some uh, classes in our professional development series. And we have handy quilter educators who are going to do some um, machine quilting classes. So we have a really, really nice lineup. And um, Jillian is going to share a video on how you can register for classes. So um, is she going to do that now or are we going to wait on that? She, yep, she's going to do the, the oh. <laughs> quick tutorial walkthrough right now of how to register. And then uh, we'll start talking about our guest. So you first want to make sure that you're logged into your account. Um, if you're on your computer, you'll see here in the upper right hand corner, it will in be here. Um, sign out if you are logged in. Um, and if you are if you're logged in, you won't need to sign out, but you just want to make sure it says sign out up right up here. Another place to check would actually be right here under your My Account tab. It should say sign out. So once you it says that, you should have your register button available. So you're going to click the register button. And it's going to take you to the registration page. Now, let's say I want to take a class with the chapter in row for Understanding the Rainbow Applying Color Theory on Friday. I'm going to click Add to Cart. And then it adds that lecture directly into my cart. And it will also add it right here to your events slash classes to be purchased. I can do the same thing on any other day by changing it and then adding another class. And we'll add our Understanding the Rainbow class in a little bit. And immediately as it right down here, 
And down below here in the payment section, you'll be able to fill out your credit card information and your address and um, click register at the very bottom right here. So that's your quick tutorial on how to register a road at home day. If you get hung up on the registration process, just shoot us an email or call us between 9 and 2 Pacific time, Monday through Friday. We'll be happy very happy to either help you through the process uh we do take registrations over the phone so long as you follow it up with an email so it's very important that we have the paper trail of what you want to register the credit card credit card company does require that written confirmation so but the one thing jillian missed is you need to go to the website which is www.road the number two ca.com so Jillian's gonna throw the link to the website in the comments for you. Um, and it's important to register early because we wanna make sure we get that registration into the system and we can make sure that we get you enrolled in the classes you want. So those classes actually happen in January. So it's really important that you do register early. Uh, we pick these dates on purpose so that if you're a working individual, it's only Friday you have to take off and then the rest of the time is on the weekend. So that's our little road at home update. So Linda, we have a guest today, don't we? We do. Lee Chapel Monroe, and she's going to be one of our um, instructors for Road at Home. Great. So I have a little blurb to read about Lee. Tell me so about Lee it. has been Lee has been creating since she first discovered discovered crayons at age two. Now I hope when she discovered the crayons, they didn't end up on the wall, but there's no guarantee of that. She's from a family of quilters and learned everything from her mother, affectionately known as the Guru. She loves all things fabric, from zippy patches to queen size quilts and everything in between. With the love of color and bold graphic shapes, Lee enjoys designing patterns and teaching all types of classes while sharing her adventures on her blog, www.maychapel.com. She is a trained graphic designer, which shows in her clean aesthetic. Her work has appeared in multiple publications, including Stitch, Quilt Maker, and Modern Patchwork. Lee is a Bernina ambassador and a Craftsy instructor. She is active member of the Triad, I believe I said that right, Modern Quilt Guild, and she lives in beautiful North Carolina. All right, well, let's welcome Lee onto the show. Hello. Hello there. All right. Hi, Thanks Lee. How are you? Oh, um, absolutely. Matt, I would never color on the wall, I want you to know. Only paper. You How know. <laughs> They have these really cool coloring books now, and we have them for Braden. Um, they they have this little brush you fill up with water, and then he and then it comes with this book, and you and you do the brush on them, and it colors the picture with the water, and then when the water dries, it goes back to you know just just line art. So it's really awesome. <laughs> so he can just and color he, it over and over and over. Right, and he, if he colors the wall. He's actually washing the walls for us. It's a so it, it's it's a win-win. It's a win-win. I yeah. love it. So, so you've been quilting for quite a while. How'd you get started? Well, my mother taught me to sew when I was really young. And I was sort of a like reluctant participant. Um, but she thought it was really important. I knew how to do it. And I made my first quilt. I was getting my first apartment. And I, ha I was moving in in two weeks, and I asked my mother to make me a quilt for my apartment. I wanted to copy the cover of the Pottery Barn catalog. And my mom was like, no, like you move in two weeks. And so I took all of her fabric and made a quilt. And that was how I kind of started quilting. So I think it we didn't look like the cover of the Pottery Barn catalog. I mean, in my mind, it did. In reality, no. <laughs> I, I remember calling her because I had previously only sewn like for home decor or garments. So I had never quilted before that project. And I called her and I said, you know, when you have like an intersection, are they supposed to line up with one another? And she said, well, it's your first quilt. So they should be close, but don't like stress out about it. Well, don't stress out about it to me meant like a half an inch was fine. Like that was close. And so it's a little wonky. You, you uh -huh. look very organized behind you. 
I I do love to organize. <laughs> um, so my fabrics all in color order. Those are all, that's all my fabric. Wow. Yes. Wow. And my big rule is like once the shelves are full, no more fabric. I have to start using it, and then I can buy more. So what kind of since you have to use your fabric, what kind of quilts um, do you make? Well, I make all kinds of things. I really like a scrappy quilt. Like I love a quilt that has, you know, like 30 or 40 different fabrics in it. So sometimes I'll work within a line, but a lot of times I'll work with like lots of different fabrics. This is my Blue Ridge quilt, which is one of the ones I'm gonna do at Road. And you'll see I have, um, it's supposed to be the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina. So it uses flying geese. But I love to have like a scrappy background. So this one has all different backgrounds and all different blues and greens. So this quilt probably has like 40 different blues and greens and background fabrics in it, but it all kind of works together when it's all done. I like to have lots of different fabrics. So somebody so doesn't have to use blue. You, they can use whatever they want. They yeah, they can make it. In fact, somebody made it with all red trees and it was like a holiday quilt for them and it was really cool looking. So, no, make it whatever color you want. That can be intimidating though. Why that is can that be intimidating though. Well, if if you're if you have 40 different you know colors of fabric, I can imagine somebody not knowing where to start. Well, so there's two things. One thing I always say is you don't need to make the quilt I made. So I have tons of different fabrics, but the reality is you only need a couple different tree fabrics and a couple different background fabrics. And you could do all the same background. So you could make this quilt with as few as seven fabrics or as many as 40. Cause I think some people really like that scrappy look. And then some people, like you said, get super stressed out about having that many different fabrics or even finding that many different ones. Yeah. And for this class, cause I know a lot of people love the scrappy quilt, but they don't love having to find a bunch of different fabrics. So I did make um, kits for this one where it'll look like mine, but I just cut it all from my stash and kind of gave everyone little scraps of all the different colors. The awesome. other things I love to make. So I love a rainbow, a rainbow. Um, so I do a lot of color classes and I have tons of different little color study projects. So this is one, this is a little Dresden. Oh. Um, so there's lots of, I love to like collect all kinds of little scraps of fabric and kind of do these fun little color studies. So I do lots of that kind of thing. Um, I love a color order project. I love color order, so. <laughs> so where do you buy your fabric? All over. Um, I definitely, I love to go in local quilt shops and kind of shop there. When I'm at a show, I always come home with like a giant haul. I make sure the shelves have room before I like go to a big show. Um, I'll buy a lot online. One of my favorite online stores my friend has is, um, she does like tons of little scrap packets and things like that. I love getting stuff like that where the shop owners like pulled together little bundles. I love things like that. And sometimes I do work within a line of fabric, but I just, I feel like it's a more unique quilt. Even if you're working within a line of fabric, if you like swap out a few, so your bundle is different than everyone else's. Do you have a, like a pre-designated amount that you would buy of a fabric? I do, that's an awesome question. So because I like to have so many fabrics in my quilts, I always buy a half a yard because that's gonna be plenty for like my style of quilting. But that said, if you are the type where you wanna have only like five or six fabrics in your quilt, then you should probably buy a yard or two yards when you shop, you know? So like my style is definitely a half a yard is plenty but I find um, if I get fat quarters, it's always like not quite enough. And then you don't have with the fabric. And, you know, so I love getting a half a yard. And then if I love a fabric, I'll buy a couple yards so that I never run out of it. And if I want it for backing, I usually buy six yards because mm. that's enough. You know, like even if it's not the whole back, it's like enough to be most of the back. Because sometimes when you're buying a fabric, you do say like 
this is going to be a quilt back. You know, this is kind of the one. And I keep my back backing fabrics separate so they don't count against my shelf storage yeah. system. <laughs> Now, if anybody has any questions as we go forward, uh, please put them in the comments and Jillian will put them up and we'll get them answered uh, right away for you. Okay, what else you got? So the others, I have lots of stuff. I pulled tons of things to show. So another thing I love is Dresden's. I refer to um, in my patterns, there's like a, a period where the Dresden period where I made a ton of Dresden patterns. But this is one, this is my pattern called um, Blooming Dresden. And it, you can see, I made it scrappy where I used two different fabrics in the Dresden circle. But obviously if somebody likes the more simple look or they wanna use less fabrics, they could just repeat and use the same. Um, and sometimes people will use 20 different fabrics and make the whole thing, you know, 20 different greens. But this is my Blooming Dresden. And this class is just called Making a Dresden. It's all about just learning all the tips of how to cut Dresdens, how to construct them, how to sew them to one another, how to press them. Um, so just sort of all my tips and tricks. So you can make a couple different patterns. The other one I, I'm offering is Georgia's Dresden. And this one is a Dresden, but it has a scrappy background. So you can kind of see the background is pieced and it has a bunch of different fabrics. So that one's fun. And this one ironically is made with one line of fabric. So even though I'm saying it's a really scrappy look, I made that particular sample with one line. So you definitely don't be afraid of doing that. It's not a bad thing. Are these um, are machine pieced? They're machine pieced, yeah, all machine pieced. And then once you've made your Dresden, there's a few different ways you can applique it onto your fabric. So you can either do it by hand, or you can do it um, by machine with like a zigzag stitch or even a decorative stitch. And then I also in that class teach a method of blind machine applique, which is um, really nice because it uses um, Wonderful Invisible thread and it gives you that hand done look so you don't see the stitches and it sort of disappears, but you do it on your machine. So it's like the best of both worlds. Um, and I, I taught that method at the last road event during the roundabout. And I probably will do that one again this time because that's a really neat way for people to get that hand sewn look, but do it on the machine. Ooh. All right, keep going. Keep going. Okay, more stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so the other, I'm doing two lectures this time. And so my lectures are, one is called Applying Color Theory. And so I'm gonna show these three. I can't figure out which way I'm supposed to move as I'm, there we go. You're doing okay. It's pretty yeah. wild, isn't it? It is, it's like, I'm like, where am I going? Which arm is that? Um, so hopefully you guys can see there's three different ones. They have the same solids in the middle. And what it is, is I'm showing how a neutral will change the fabric. So the front one is a really, this one is a really cool gray. And then the middle one is a neutral gray. And then this last one over here, this one that's kind of brown is a warm gray. And so if you were to cover up on your screen, if you kind of cover up the two that are, um, like on this one, if I cover up the cool fabrics, the cool makes the warm pop. It makes the warms even brighter. Whereas when you go to the warm one, the warm one is gonna make the cools brighter. So the, the applying color theory is sort of all about how you can take these concepts from art and kind of do different things. So the way we would apply that to quilting is if I was making like a red and white quilt, if I wanted it to feel really calm and sort of have like a, you know, more antique or traditional vibe, then I could use a cream instead of white. So use like a cream and that's gonna calm down the red and give it sort of a blendy effect. Or if I wanted my red to feel really punchy and bright, then I can pick a really blue white and that's gonna intensify the reds. So we can kind of get the effect that we want in our finished project. Um, and that class is fun because I talk a lot, of, or that lecture rather, um, is fun because I talk a lot about how you can kind of, based on who you're giving the quilt to, you know, like, most of the world prefers a cool color. 
So if you're making a project for someone and you don't know them that well, you can make your project out of cool colors and they're gonna, you know, like there's a huge likelihood they'll really like that. Yeah. Um, so that, that one's fun. And then in the color class, um, we're gonna make this project, which is the Dresden that I had showed y'all. Um, and again, you'll learn all about making Dresdens in that class, but you also get to kind of figure out wh what exactly is the difference from red to an orange red or a purple red. You know, and I think it really helps people to kind of understand those differences as they're picking out their projects. You know, this is what will make it brighter. Or this is what will make it calmer. Um, so we'll kind of talk about all the different ways you can put colors together. Cool. So, and you have another lecture. I have another lecture. So my other lecture is um, tips. So it's all different piecing tips. So that one, um, I've been doing a tips lecture for many years now and it's it's pretty popular because it's basically just me for like an hour spouting off as many tips as I can say, you know, in that hour. <laughs> um, and so a lot of them will be things you know. So sometimes I'm telling you something you already practice. Sometimes I'm reminding you of something, you know, someone will be like, my mom definitely told me that years ago. Um, like when I say from my grandmother in my tips lecture is, she used to mark on her thumb little hatch marks that were perfectly measured or an eighth of an inch apart so that when she was hand sewing, she would have perfect stitches because she could lay her thumb next to it and kind of follow that. You know, and that's kind of an old fashioned tip, but it's such a great one. It if is. I'm doing like, yeah, if I'm doing running stitches for like quilting, like a hand quilting running stitch, then I like to mark my thumb because people will say, oh, your stitches are so perfectly even. And I'm sure there are people that can do that without a marker, but I'm not one of them. So, you know, <laughs> like that's really helpful. But this time the lecture is going to be all piecing tips. So we're just talking about different piecing things. Wow. Well, that's excellent. So what do you do when you're not quilting? Well, I, I, I used to travel. Um, <laughs> back in the day. Um, no, I love to travel and um, I, I, I will like go anywhere, do anything. In fact, one time my friend and I were planning a trip to Ecuador and, or we were really planning a trip to Brazil. Sorry, I've already kind of spoiled the story. We were planning a trip to Brazil and we got to the Miami airport and we found out that while we'd filed the first part of our visa, we had not filed the second part of our visa. And so they told us, you can't go to Brazil, like you don't have a visa, so you can't even get on the plane. So I was like, well, where can we go? And it was the Saturday before Thanksgiving. So like the airport was nice and calm. And he gave us like four choices. Our choices were Greece, um, Ecuador, Colombia, and Costa Rica. And I was like, let's go to Ecuador. So <laughs> we just went to Ecuador. So like, I'm always game for a trip and it ended up being an awesome, you know, trip that I would have never, that's not somewhere that was like on my list to go to, but it's amazing if you ever get a chance, I highly recommend it. Mm. Um, so I'm big on travel. Um, during quarantine, I've done a lot of reading, that sort of stuff, but hopefully we're gonna be back out and about. Soon. It sounds that way. Soon. Fingers crossed. So. so are your backing fabrics just as organized as those? Of course they are. They're in two different drawers. There's a warm drawer and a cool drawer. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, see, somebody I, else loves Ecuador. Yay. Ecuador is the third largest producer of chocolate in the world. And you know what else they're a huge producer of is flowers. So when you drive out of Quito, there are just like miles and miles of greenhouses. And we just like stopped and asked if we could go in and they were like, sure. And there's just like bazillions of roses everywhere. Wow, yeah, it's, that's amazing. It's a really, really friendly country. Like I've never felt so welcome. You know, it, it was just amazing. Wow. Nice. Well, I think I think we'll be able to travel again soon. And <laughs> fingers crossed. Right? Fingers crossed. I Ecuador's known for roses. Mm -hmm. I did not know this. Well, Joe's like the 
I know Jill is like, and we did not go to the Galapagos. So we left the um, Miami airport and went and bought an Ecuador um, guidebook. Because at the time I was like, we could go to the Galapagos. So we're on the plane reading our guidebook. Like I opened the guidebook on the plane. And the first sentence is, if you're planning on going to the Galapagos, you should plan at least six months in advance. And I was like, oh, <laughs> let's not do that. But we are hopefully going to go back. We just did, we did like Quito and did North and South and did the coast. So we, we did travel most of the country. It sounds like you got to use U.S. money, too. We did. And you should take ones because a $1 bill is actually more valuable than a $20 bill because they don't print their own money, so they use U.S. currency. So $1 bills are very, like, sought after. And if you, no one will take your 5 or 20 Like, they don't like to give you change because there's not enough money to give you change. Wow. I wonder if they would take $2 bills. I'm sure that I'm sure that they would. I don't know. They do have their that's own coins. The, okay, that's one of the things we did uh, pre-COVID for Road is we gave change in two dollar bills. Oh, nice! For See? Admission tickets. Yes. I bet. I bet that they would take them. There and then we tracked those two dollar bills all over Southern California. To, like, watch them get spent. Oh, I love it! I bet they went way further than Southern California. They they did they did but I mean, our reach you know the, the the connections we have in Southern California so the airport the the guys are being tipped all these two dollar bills and oh it's crazy. I remember when I was a kid, my grandfather gave me two dollar bills and I didn't want to spend them because I thought they were so cool, so I just hoarded them. Somebody I, I heard a story. Somebody took their two dollar bills from Rhodes somewhere overseas and they thought they were counterfeit. <laughs> <laughs> I could see that. Wow. Perfect. Well, mm. it's very important that you get online and you register for Lee's classes yeah. and lectures. If you can't figure out the registration system, that's okay. Just shoot us an email or give us a call and we'll gladly walk you through the process. Um, but the cutoff for Lee's classes with kits is coming up fast. It'll be early May. I believe it's May 6th. 6th or 7th. I don't know. They're, they're flashing different dates at me. And then the the cutoff for her regular class is actually be 24 hours before the start of class. So the class is without kits. You can actually register all the way up to the start of class. But the kits, it's make, make sure you get in early so we can get that kit shipped out to you. Yeah, and you will receive, if, you are, if you're in a kit class, you will receive a communication from your instructor to uh, give you the process and get your information, how to get your kit to you. So you don't want to wait till the last minute. So get your kit classes and um, get your registration. Yes. And I've already had quite a few students. I put my kits on my website. So I've already had students go ahead and purchase them. But like Linda said, you'll definitely get an email from me about it. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, Lee. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Wonderful to have you. Oh, absolutely. And we're going to switch next to a quick video about our Road to California Friday classes. And I bet you they'll see a couple <laughs> pictures of yours, I have too. Some Friday classes. Wonderful. So go ahead, Jillian. Let's play that video.
Wonderful. And remember, you can sign up for those classes on our website. So Linda, Stevie yeah. would normally have a book review for us, but she's having some internet problems today. So we're going to go straight to the UFO graveyard. Uh-oh. Let's have it. All right, Jillian, put the first one on there. Okay. So this is submitted by Christine, and she calls it Spiderweb. And this is what she says. Made in, 19, made in the 1970s from scraps using a pattern in McCall's magazine. Foundation pieced on newspaper. Fabric includes, and I think this is important to pay attention to, the fabric includes cotton, polyester, double knits, dotted Swiss, upholstery, corduroy, chiffon, seersucker, everything I use to make dresses, my husband's shirts, my son's hearing aid harnesses, curtains, etc. Lots of memories, but not sturdy enough to quilt. Picture has one corner turned down to show the foundation newspaper still attached. I think I was afraid, hold on here, to that it would fall apart if I removed the paper. So what do you think, Linda? This has got a lot going on. This has a lot of memory. Um, if I could save it, I, I think maybe if you soaked this quilt in, in some water that would help you pull out the paper easier. If you pull it out while it's a little damp, um, that'll help you not rip out the stitches. Um, <laughs> You know, newsprint that old would probably just disintegrate in water after a little while. Yeah, yeah, and and of course you need to get it a little a little cleaner. Um, but they make a product for that. You can buy a retro clean. They're they're a road vendor of ours that does. My mother in law uses them on antique tablecloths. She buys at the swap meet, and the stuff is fantastic. So it would really clean up that. Uh, that background. Yeah, I, I I think if you put that paper, you know, if, if you got the paper wet and you got the majority of it out and you layered it sturdy enough, and you could probably tie it and use it. Uh, if you wanted to quilt it, I would probably re do a little research and find a machine quilter who is is uh, a little more experienced with um, older quilts. And then I, I think that I think that actually wouldn't be as hard to find. Here's Sarah said, try ironing a lightweight interface. Yeah, an interface but, that that would work really well to stabilize it. The, the other, there's been a, quite a movement here in the past five to seven years of taking these antique quilts and, you know, uh, long armors are doing it a lot and they're long arming them and they really, uh, they really, you know, turn out gorgeous. And this, this might just be one. There is one thing to think about though. If you soak it to get that paper out, you don't want the colors to bleed off of all those different fabrics. And I'm not sure if uh, color catchers, you know, in the water would really, um, be a help with that or not? Well, if she used, if those fabrics have been already used for dresses and shirts, I'm sure they've been washed already. Clearly, not by me, since washing is not necessarily one of my strong points in domestic life. Um, <laughs> we, we won't go there. Um, but if, if they've been used for something, a dress, a shirt, or whatever, they've probably been washed, I would think. Yeah, I'm going to vote that this should be finished. This this is a very 
a very nice, you know, personal quote with a lot of meanings, uh, meanings to Christine. I, I think this should be, this should be finished. I agree with you. I, I think she should do some, some definite research before um, she moves forward with it just a little bit, you know, to find somebody that will be able to do it and do it properly. Um, and I think it would be a really, really great heirloom to have for the family. Absolutely. And put a label on it explaining where those fabrics came from. This Again, was grandpa's can't... underwear. This was... So important. All right, Jillian, go to number two. All right. The, Carly submitted this one, and it's called Starburst. I made this quilt as part of the New England Motel Quilt Sew Along hosted by Brimfield Awakening. It was super fun to piece, but I'm having trouble deciding if I quilt each section individually or block sections together since they are small. Hmm. Well, the, the Brimfield girls do an awesome job with their um, with their designs. Um, I might I might group them with my quilting. What do you think? I might I might group the the quilting per per colors. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm looking at the. I, I'm just studying the design. I, I didn't get a chance to uh, to look at this one before we put it up here. Um, it's really fascinating. I, I I'm enjoying the the different stars, and I, there's more to it, you know, because it looks like one side's cut off of the quilt. Um, I yeah, I could see. I, I don't think you want to do each each item differently i think that would just become too busy and take away from the almost simplistic yet yet it's you know complex nature of the design i really like it i mean um, when i look at it i'm seeing the individual stars yes i like it yes you, you could quilt the stars differently than than the others so that would be different yeah yeah, I, I this agree. Is definite. Keep it and stitch it. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. This is this is a one hundred percent stitch it, and you can you can uh, you could take one of our handy quilter classes, one of those handy quilter um, education uh, classes to really. There's a class on how do I finish it that would be really excellent for this. They have all sorts of different options um, for that. There we go. Yeah, and we have a comment. What's that comment say, Jillian? I can't read it. Yeah, you. Oh, that's different. You could group them into diamonds. There you go. That's something. Yeah. Well, this is definitely a, a stitch it. Stitch and if it. you want your quilt um, on the next episode of It's So Road, go ahead and fill out the Google form online. Remember, just for filling it out and getting selected to be on It's So Road, Linda is going to send you a free PDF download of a pattern. And you will be entered to win one of Linda's classes for during Road at Home May that I will be paying the kit people. So you really have nothing to lose by entering your quilt to the UFO graveyard. So you really need to do this because you know it it's the, the patterns retail for like ten dollars and classes are worth up to um seventy five, eighty dollars. Depending on what you really? choose. So there's just send us a picture. Yep, there's the link. You can even use a pseudo name. You don't have to use your, your actual name. We'll read whatever you put it on there within reason. So uh have some fun with it. <laughs> now I believe we're gonna close the show today with Stevie's product review. We got the internet issue worked out. So Stevie's gonna hop on and give us a book review. So here we go. Hello. Hello from Leesburg, Virginia, where it is 82 degrees. Um, I'm not quite ready for summer yet, but it's um, 
we have pollen now instead of um, humidity, I guess. And we're supposed to get locusts, but we're not going to talk about that. So today I'm going to talk about fast fold hexi quilting by Mary Hogan. Whoops, here we go. Whoops. Okay. So this is a new technique for either doing uh, hexagons by machine or by, by hand. Now, uh, we're going to give away this book that I used to do my little sample, but we also have from Fox Chapel two copies of this one, which is uh, has the instructions for the technique. Ooh, that's looks like I've got a UFO coming in on that. Yeah. <laughs> um, instructions for um, the technique, and it has patterns for four different projects. The larger book has. Um, 20 projects in it, all with the same technique. So what the technique was is it requires, I'm taking a, a needle I just took out of my foot that I stuck in there. So better me than my husband, right? So it's, you need two circles, a big one and, whoops, and a little one and a hexagon, a batting. And the batting goes in the middle like this. And then you you iron with an iron, you you turn what's supposed to be centered. You, you fold over up against the edge of the hexagon all the way around so that this becomes a hexagon. You do the same thing with a small circle um, by folding it into the middle and you go around and around and you end up with another hexagon and so obviously you have some raw edges here you had some raw, you have some raw edges when you finish folding the bigger circle and you put them raw, raw edges together and either hand or machine sew around oops there you go so i opted to sew these hexagons by machine now you can you can join the hexagons by machine. I did it by hand because I wasn't real accurate when I was doing my ironing, but it's just like doing English paper piecing. Oh, look at that. So you just offset them and you can see how these are going to uh, fold into each other. And I just, every, every time, so here I am, I've just finished this one and then the next one is going to be this way. As I said, I had a little bit of variance in the, the width of the side, so that's why I decided to hand do it. But I could keep on going, keep on going for as long as until I ran out of this fabric. But if I run out of this fabric, it's okay because I bought this in Bali and I just have to go back to Bali to buy some more. So who wouldn't want to go to Bali and buy fabric, right? <laughs> So, uh, do we have an Oreo picture, Jillian? <gasps> look, look who ate an Oreo. This is actually <laughs> called a belted Galloway cattle, um, but they all come come out uh, a lot of the mama um, Galloway just looking like that. They just have that big white. Uh, stripe around the middle. They do look like an Oreo. So I think that those are rather funny looking cows. I've never seen one of those in my travels around the United States. Okay, next we're going to have a special presentation of Road at Home classes that will be happening on the Friday. So take it away, Jillian. No, we're not. We're not. You missed that. We, we filled that in when you were gone. Oh, because I had tech technical difficulties so She's I, following uh, script. Uh, Google yeah, didn't like me. Uh, so we, we improvised okay um, I really enjoyed um, uh, Lee's comment about how much fabric that she buys but I was trained by the late great Doreen Speckman who said if you don't like a fabric you buy three yards if you like it you buy ten. Oh my and, and Considering the amount of fabric I have downstairs in my fabric room, 
I bought three yards if I didn't like it and 10 if I liked it. <laughs> <So> <laughs> I'm, I, I, I have a room that just holds fabric. <laughs> mm. well, but that's, aren't we lucky? That's the true confessions for today. <laughs> <laughs> well, wonderful. So next week, oh, hold on. We have a comment. There are belted gals on a farm near my home in Dover, New Hampshire. Oh, and I'm going to go see Cynthia on Friday. Oh, there you go. You'll be able to see the cows. You need to get us another Oreo cow picture. Okay, I will try to do that. Yes, I'm driving to Maine tomorrow. Um, well, my son and daughter and I think I'm coming to see them, but I'm really coming to see six-year-old Cooper. So, uh, <laughs> But then on Friday, I get to go see Cynthia. So uh, I'm really looking forward to that. So. Wonderful. And I think you're going to be recording a video while you're there that'll be on next week's It's So Rhoda. Yes. Yes. Barring Perfect. technical difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> so next week we have Catherine Redford on to talk to us about her classes and all the stuff she does when she's not quilting. Ah, oh, I wonder if she, so, she, she bakes scones. Oh, I don't know, but Jen makes a killer blueberry scone. Yeah, but Catherine's from England, so she might have some really interesting views on food, too. Oh, we'll and have to uh, ask her. Yeah. And if those of you who follow Matt and I on, on um, Facebook know that uh, Matt and I like food. <laughs> we're usually eating someplace. <laughs> Absolutely. It's not a trip unless we're eating. So next week, come back, join us as we chat with Catherine Redford. We have two more quilts for the UFO graveyard that you're going to submit this week. And I believe Stevie will have another product review. Yes, I will. Yes, I will. So come back and join us. Thank you. Stay safe and get vaccinated so we can all be together again in January. Yes, please. Already done it. Get the shot. <laughs> Get the shot.